okay, week six of fall anime. It's kind of crazy how fast the season's finishing up. We're already like past the halfway point. So yeah, let's quickly get into it. Some good shows this week. Let's start off with uh, Mushiko Tensei episode eight. So very good episode. We kind of get like a new point in the story. Rudy is in the squad, dead end. They go to a new city, a new kingdom. And then now like Rudy is kind of sees the next point in this mission. The God kind of tells him, all right, this is what you're going to do here to like rescue some people in your family. So he realizes that Aisha and her mom are here. So that's basically Rudy's sister, the red-haired one. She's like six years old. She's kind of like a maid. And then we meet her here. She's like, she's so cool. She's like smart, wisecracking and shit. So like I'm falling in love with her kind of. So basically her and her mom were kind of kidnapped and she was trying to run away, trying to send some letters. Her kidnappers don't seem like very hostile, but yeah, they're just like trapping her there. Rudy just realizes that like she's going to come. So he goes and rescues her. They run away and they talk. So... Yeah, she talks about how her older brother, Rudius, is kind of like a pervert. So yeah, Rudius kind of like keeps his identity secret because his little sister doesn't even like him. So yeah, things seem to be good so far, but then like, yeah, something happens. So so this girl, Ginger, she's part of like the prince's royal guard. She's like, oh, Roxy wants to see you. Let's go to the castle. So then, yeah, he innocently goes through like he has a staff, but he doesn't like ask Rougiard or Iris to come with him. They're, they're already chilling like why don't you ask them but no he goes by himself this looks like it's an obvious trap they ask for his weapons it's all kind of creepy everyone's quiet but yeah Rudy just doesn't care he just goes through and then he sees the prince as roxy student the like young ugly bastard dude who's just like so creepy his personality was actually hilarious since he like commits it so hard this dude he wants to kind of like rape roxy make her his sex slave and you know whatever so then um he kind of like puts a trap door under Rudius. So yeah, um, cool comic book villain technique there. And then Rudius gets trapped in this magic ceiling circle. So he can't really escape. And then the guy's like, oh, we're going to invite Roxy here. She's going to rescue you, but then we're going to trap her. And I'm going to kill you. So yeah, um, we're kind of in trouble now. It doesn't seem to be like a big deal. So this dude's obviously not like the main villain or anything. And I guess next episode we'll probably like defeat him pretty easily. But yeah, it's pretty funny so far. We realized that Roxy is not like near this kingdom. So his plan doesn't even like it's not even going to work. But yeah, we see that Aisha's mom is like still kidnapped. So I guess we just got to save her. And I wonder how he's going to get out of this. Maybe like crack the floor or something. But yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe Rougiard will help him. But that prince dude was so creepy. <laughs> okay, so for Tacked Up Destiny Episode 7. This was a cool kind of plot episode. A lot of stuff happened. Cool character developments. But also, like, the main villain is kind of dumb here. So, yeah, he's actually finally revealed. I don't know if he's the main villain, but damn, he's kind of like a mix between Thanos and Hitler. Except he's kind of like the watered-down version. So, yeah, let's get into it. So, yeah, what happened? I guess um the, the squad, they're going on, they're continuing the road trip. There's kind of like a traffic jam. So, we finally see, like, a bunch of cars on the street because there's, like, a bunch of refugees from the next town over. And then, yeah, like, the D2s were attacking, so a lot of people were evacuating. We see, like, parents and children, they're all, like, kind of relocated, so it's pretty sad atmosphere. We see Destiny, she's like, I'm a music guard, I'll go rescue them and help them. The thing is, though, Tact, he's a bit tired now, he got bags in his eyes, he's not focused. Because he's, like, trying to write his own, uh, he's trying to compose his own song. But then it's like, he's just failing, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't have a piano with him, so... Yeah, like, when he went to New Orleans, he played the piano, he got inspired, but now, you know, he's still stuck, he can't, like, figure out what song to play, or what song to write. Destiny tries to help him, Anna tries to help him, but he's still, like, you know, he's still tired and not caring. Destiny tries to, like, understand him a bit more, so we see Destiny kind of opening up. She's like, oh, how was the girl Koseto, like, before me? Because she realized that, yeah, she's <laughs> kind of a replacement. So yeah, I love how Destiny's getting some more self-awareness, like, interacting with the world. And then, yeah, we see them, like, kind of helping the people, so it's pretty chill. And then in the end of the episode, some D2s attack. So they're kind of like these, uh, llama-looking D2s. These big, like, type of animal ones. And then we see that they were summoned by Hell and, uh, her maestro, <laughs> Schindler. So it's revealed that Schindler, his music art Hell, has the power to summon D2s. And he's actually one, like, summoning D2s around the world. To just like kill the people to like save resources. <laughs> so it's so dumb. We see his motivation. He's like, oh, the world's resources are limited. He kind of has a twofold motivation. One is to kill people to kind of like re restore like the natural resources so it doesn't run out. The second goal is to basically he hates poor people. So he's like, I'm going to hit them like on the corner slums or in the surrounding area and the big cities are going to be fine. So we see that he's actually causing all the D2 problems. And he's the one who like made 
uh, Destiny and Tack like turn into music arts in the first place. So he attacked their city as well. I, I I really can't understand why he's doing this. Like, oh, he just wants to be evil. I also doesn't don't understand. Like, he's obviously such an evil character. His music art is named Hell, first of all. Although she's like really cool. But it's like, how is he promoted so much? Like, I guess he's because he's powerful. But how is this evil dude like obviously so evil from being like promoted as like the top captain? Like, I guess he's about to like kill Tact and Destiny. So yeah, they're about to fight, but. You know, you just revealed your evil plan. You're kind of like hilariously comic book evil. But yeah, I wonder what his end game is. We see Lenny and Titan also like they, they might help Tact and Destiny. They're kind of like in the area. So yeah, I'm interested because like we don't really have a villain in this uh, series so far yet. So I guess like Schindler's the obvious main villain. And yeah, I'm curious to see what's going to happen because like it, it, it feels kind of cheap that this is the reason all the D2s are attacking. It's, it's all because of this guy. I thought they'd just be naturally attacking, so, like, I wonder if you kill this guy, the whole problem will be solved. So, yeah, a lot of questions came up after this episode, but it was still, like, kind of, like, a cool story progression episode. So, I wonder how we're gonna defeat Schindler and survive next episode. Okay, so for Platinum End Episode 7, pretty hilarious episode. It kind of went, like, a direction I did not expect, which was, like, pretty hype. So, we saw Mukaido, he got blown up by the bomb, set up by Metropolitan, but then, um, he has, like, this blast-proof armor, so good shit by him. He's okay, he's not harmed. But then, like, Metropolitan Man came through, so it's like, now it's a 2v1 fight. He asks his angel Meza protect his back, so he can't be attacked from the back. So then Mukaido and Mirai, they kind of, like, try to strategize on how to beat him. Thing is, uh, Mirai, he kind of, like, he's kind of useless. He doesn't want to shoot people. He doesn't want to kill people. So Mukaido's like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna pretend to be the guy with the white and red arrows, and then Mirai can just be the guy with the red arrow to throw him off. So then, um, Mukaido kind of sacrifices himself. He's like, alright, shoot me, bro. And Amirai's gonna, like, you know, counterattack when he gets shot. So he's kind of baiting him. The thing is, things kind of go off the rails. And then Metropolitan's like, oh, I got a bomb threat. I got a second bomb set up. So then this was an obvious bluff. Why would he have two bombs, like, randomly set up? So then, like, they kind of stand down and he, like, he's like, oh, I'm gonna shoot you now. Or else, like, innocent civilians' deaths are gonna be on your hand. This is so dumb. Like, it's only, like, because of the characters, like, good people that it, it works. But yeah. They kind of stand down. The thing is, uh, Mirai, he actually does something. So he realizes you can deflect arrows with other arrows. So he deflects the white arrow with his red arrow. And he goes on a rampage. He's like, he's all angry. And he's just like melee range attacking Metropolitan with the red arrow. So he's like doing kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's like, he has pretty good reflexes. So I guess that's why he has like an elder angel. Like, actually pretty good at combat. So he's like deflecting arrows. Like if one arrow touches you, you're about to die. But he's like, deflecting them, going in melee range, attacking him. So... Yeah, pretty, like, funny, uh, was planned by Mirai. So then, um, yeah, Metropolitan, he's, like, surprised. He gets, like, overwhelmed a bit. And he's like, yo, why is this guy, like, so powerful? Like, what, what? And then Mukaido, he comes up with the Glock, shoots him in the back a bunch of times. So then, yeah, Metropolitan, like, he's unable to move because he's, like, being shot. And he has to, like, protect his front. So Mirai has the perfect chance to hit him with the red arrow. End the series right there. Yo, we got our god candidate. But no, Mirai hesitates. He sees, um... Metropolitan's face, the like the student with the white hair, he kind of hesitates, sees him flinch, and then, yeah, he flies away last second. So, Mirai was unable to shoot him with the red arrow, unfortunately. So, he can't shoot people with white or red arrows. Like, well, come on, bro. But yeah, I guess that's like a kind of good way to prolong the series. Like, as we can see, like these characters can fight now. They got battle suits, and the status quo has changed a little. So, like, Mirai is actually like kind of a main character. Nobody died in this fight, which was like a pretty good relief, and I guess we're chilling for now. The end of the episode was kind of corny because we see um, Saki. She's kind of weird because she's like, oh, um, I can't be friends with Mirai. I can't love him. Yeah, probably some drama there. And yeah, I guess um, we're going to enter a new arc soon. Okay, so for Osama ranking episode 6, a bunch of shit happened this episode, which is uh, pretty funny. Again, like this episode is keeping the energy of just like fun adventures, but like a lot of like cool world building and like some sinister plot. So we see Boji's trying to get stronger. So he asks the king that rescued him. Oh yeah, can you help me get stronger? The king is like, oh, you're too weak to like help. So I can't help you there. Cause like Boji's like practicing with his wooden stick, trying to fight this big armor dude. Boji's good at dodging, but he's not like strong enough to like have this guy teach him. And then his name is Desha. He's the king of the underworld and he's rank two, which is like, you know, pretty huge. But he's also like pretty friendly dude, so I guess he respects um Bos, who's uh, Boji's dad. But yeah, the main thing to know is that Boji actually has like really cool dodging skills, but it doesn't help him beat the enemies. Like you gotta tire them out, I guess. Also, we see that there was a misunderstanding. Kage forgot like the name of the king, so he thought it was Desha. 
but it's actually like Desha's brother Despa. So they got a new destination to go to, visit Despa, who's gonna teach them how to get stronger. We see um Dida, he like dropped the drink, he didn't want to drink that elixir made from his dad's blood. And then the dude Apis comes, he's a dude with the spear. He tries to attack Dida. But then um, the mirror stops him. We see that the mirror lady is named Lady Mirancho. So she's actually a real person, but I guess she like turned into this mirror spirit. And then yeah, she's super evil, which we know. We don't know her full intentions, but basically her and Apis, they kind of team up on Dida. They knock him out. They pick up the drink that he dropped. So five second rule. And they feed that to Dida. So Dida drinks the elixir. And then she says, oh Dida, this elixir won't make you stronger. And they don't tell us what it'll do, what it'll do but like evil kind of like set up right there. Um, this elixir is probably gonna do something to Dida, maybe like summon a demon inside of him. They talked about like Pandora's box, we see like devils in this world, so you know, some shit might happen. So, poor Dida, he was actually looking good, but now, yeah, stuff's about to be bad for him. Also, we see um, Boji and Kage they meet up with Despa at the end, so he's like this blonde haired dude with like some mustache, so yeah, he looks nice and friendly, maybe he'll help them, so we'll see. Okay, so for 86 Season 2, Episode 7, it's kind of interesting because it's time for war, so all the 86ers and a bunch of other rejects are going to the front lines, try to defeat this, like, big-ass legion attack. A lot of stuff happened this episode, I guess, but, like, it was kind of, like, off-screen, fast-forward, a lot of narration. We see that the leader of the country, he's like, okay, I'll respect your decision to have the 86ers fight, but, like, are you sure you're not, like, trying to e ethnically cleanse the people? So it's like he's like he's trying to accuse them of racism like he's trying to make sure like oh they're not being racist. That's like a main theme in this uh, series uh, like racism everywhere like people hate these 86ers. It's kind of like unrealistic though they're giving so much weight to these 86ers but I guess they're like the main characters so. So much focus on them surviving like not, not living a life of peace. Basically like the 86ers are sent to fight. We see that the general like the energetic blonde lady she's actually like uh, volunteers to fly them as well so. Yeah, everyone's on the front lines now. We see Frederica, she wanted to come in a mission, but they told her, no, you can't come. So yeah, she's uh, kind of sad. She's the only one who, like, wasn't able to show up. But I guess, like, they didn't want her to die, of course. Also see, like, the dude, like, the president, he's like, all right, if the 86ers die, I'm about to destroy the world. <laughs> or I destroyed this world. So it's so funny how serious he is at saving these kids. But yeah, they're starting the mission. We quickly see that, like, a lot of forces are down, so... Yeah, we don't know how much time has passed, but basically, like, yeah, the fighting is starting. There's a lot of bodies. We see that there was, like, some racism throughout the intercoms at the end of the episode, where, like, I was like, yeah, these damn 86ers will die for us. And then we see, like, oh, Shin, he's smiling, he's bloodlusted. So maybe he's going to do a rescue, miracle save, and kill everyone. But yeah, kind of cool progression of the war. It's definitely, like, very suspenseful. I wonder, like, where it's going to go, how it's going to, like, link up to, like, Lena and what she's doing. And we're getting very close to the conclusion of the season. So, yeah, each episode probably, like, the battle is going to progress. And I wonder we're going to go from here. Who's going to die? Who's going to live? And if everything's going to be happy or we still got to fight racism in the end. Okay, so for Mirku-chan, episode 8. Another solid episode. So, yeah, first off, we see Mirko. She's, like, um, hanging out with her brother, Kyosuke. And they're trying to buy some presents for her mom. So they buy like this uh, dress. The thing is, um, they want to see how it fits. So Mirku kind of wears it. The thing is, there's a ghost in the fitting room. So she's like stone faced, just like staring at the mirror, not wanting to react. And then her brother opens the curtain, and then they see like, oh, everything's fine. So yeah, they're like, oh yeah, the dress looks good. Let's uh, pay for it. The thing is, Mirku doesn't want to go back in her changing room to change back to her normal outfit. So she's like, oh, I'll just wear the dress outside. <laughs> so like the present they're gonna give for her mom, they like Mirku just like takes it herself. I feel like, just ignore the ghost, bro, like, they're not gonna do anything. But yeah, she's probably just, like, so scared, like, any wrong movement and she's dead, so... Yeah, it's always on her mind. She still has, like, two protection charms on her, so... Yeah, I guess she's saving those. So yeah, her and Kyosuke, they go back on a train together. And we see this axe ghost. So he's kind of, like, the kind of spookiest one we've seen so far, where... He's not that scary design-wise, but he's just, like, crawling around with an axe. And each train passenger... Just swinging the axe at their face, like, boom, boom. He's just swinging axes at people. They don't really affect them, though. So, like, we see that his ghost axe, like, actually doesn't hit people. But then Miko's kind of scared. She, like, thinks, oh, like, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna react? Am I gonna flinch? Like, he might kill me. So, yeah, they're just sitting on the train while the axe ghost is, like, swinging his axe one by one. So, yeah, Miko's kind of scared. The thing is, like, there's, like, a woman sitting next to Miko who has, like, a ghost actually, like, inside of her, I guess. Just, like, living there. So then the axe ghost swings at her. And then, like, we see that, like, oh, he pulls the ghost out. So, I guess Miko is safe from that, but yeah, she was, uh, kind of scared. We realized that Miko's trying to think of ways to fight ghosts. Like, she might have a way to exercise them, because that's where, um, 
Yoria and the fortune teller, they're also like helping her out with that. But yeah, Miko's still too scared. So we see like she's trying to progress. She's trying to grow as a character, maybe like have a way to fight and defend herself. But yeah, it's still a long ways away. We see there was a skit where um their teacher was pregnant and then her first baby, like she had a miscarriage. So it was her second try. And then we see like kind of like this ghost entering the fetus. So like Miko's kind of like scared. Like, oh shit, this, this might be bad. But then the teacher explains, so then Miko's like, okay, that makes sense. And then, like, I guess the fetus absorbs the energy of the ghost, so I guess it'll be happy, healthy baby. We also end the episode on a creepy note, where since Miko's teacher is on maternity leave, their new teacher comes in. He's that spooky dude who has this, like, demon surrounding him. He's bad news. He has red eyes, orange hair. He literally looks like a demon. And yeah, his name is Tono Zen. So yeah, Miko, nowhere is safe for Miko. The anime, they're adding new characters, keeping it spicy, and I wonder how much more suffering she'll get next episode. And yeah, that's it for this week. I'm keeping up with the shows. Very spicy, very nice, and a lot of cool story progressions. I'm excited to see what comes next. I missed a few shows this week, but yeah, let me know what your favorite episode this week was.